Does anyone have something on their mind that they would like to talk about? I'm struggling with dullness a lot lately. You're struggling with dullness a lot lately. I think both in and out of my practice. Yeah. Well, what's uh, other than the dullness? How is your practice? Are you? It's pretty steady. I think generally steady, but I find that I, I pretty quickly I'll, I'll get into. Um, maybe a little bit sleepy or something. It, well, it'll feel like I'll think that I'm sitting there in a good place, and then I'll, I'll <coughs> wake up a little bit, and I'll realize that I was dull. And so it keeps going like that, but I can't get out of that spot. Okay, so before you, before the dullness comes, and then you become aware of it, there's a period where you actually feel like you're quite focused on Okay, so in that case, this is exactly when the dullness normally does come, and uh, it's, it's, it's the right place. Um, it's because you're becoming more focused, and your mind is becoming quieter, and you are withdrawing from other distractions, that your, your mind is tending to slip into dullness. So. It's good in that regard. It's quite appropriate for the stage that you're at. <coughs> now, uh, a couple of things. Now, one is that what's happening actually is that you're becoming probably somewhat absorbed in a meditation object, but you don't have sufficient you haven't trained your mind sufficiently that you can go into that kind of absorption without tending to go into dullness. Mm -hmm. And the the ultimate uh, resolution of that is that you clearly see the sensations of the breath, but you have more of an introspective awareness accompanying that so that you are aware of the mind that is observing the sensations of the breath And that means that you will notice right away if that mind starts to slip into dullness, and then you can, you know, brighten up your awareness and come out of it. Okay. Um, Actually, there's a parallel with this. When you start to become too absorbed in the meditation object uh, before you're really ready to in terms of the training, that's the point where also you can suddenly get carried away by something and, you know, but uh, definitely the dullness. This is when the dullness comes. So what you actually need to do is to train your mind not to slip into the dullness. And that's all about recognizing whenever the dullness is there and applying an appropriate antidote to the dullness. Okay, And then just doing that as many times as necessary until finally all the right connections get made up here so that concentration is good, and the mind stays clear instead of slipping into dullness. Okay, so so um, just first of all, accept it as a, a necessary part of the training and a stage you go through. Okay. But it's really important that you you uh, do you, that you do the right thing, and that's that you're aware that dullness is probably going to arise. And so you're watching for it. And as soon as you become aware of it, then you apply an antidote, strong enough antidote that is going to bring you back to a state of wakefulness that lasts at least for a few minutes, at least for two or three minutes. As you come back up to alertness, and then within seconds you're sinking again, it wasn't strong enough. Okay. Okay? Okay. And you don't worry that, you know, well, two or three minutes, why not ten minutes? Because... Two or three minutes, is, is, is that's enough to produce the, the training effect. And probably uh, a stronger antidote isn't going to do any more good at that time. As you're just more likely to agitate the mind. But if you can stay distinctly more alert for another two or three minutes after you've done this, then you know you've, you've, you've woke yourself up adequately. And just keep repeating that. And in this process, you will begin to recognize dullness sooner and sooner. So that initially, you won't notice it until the dullness is already fairly strong. And that's, is that sort of where you're right now? Yeah. 
So you get absorbed in the meditation of the object. And because you're not, you don't have this introspective awareness, your perception of the med- meditation object is gradually becoming a little more fuzzy and vague and relaxed, and, and you don't realize that anything's happening until all of a sudden you find yourself slumping or jerking or something like that. Or, you know, it was in, out, in, out, and then it turned into a garage door opening and closing. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Hypnagogic imagery, yeah, some, something else happened. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, but that, that's all right. You work with that, but you, but you try to remain sufficiently aware of the clarity that you have so that you can catch it more and more quickly. And uh, do you need me to go over the antidotes? Or yeah. So clenching all the muscles, eventually standing up if I have to, yeah. just mentioning to myself, be more alert or more aware. Right. And it, when you start catching it earlier, so that you're noticing that you're just starting to lose that clarity, then uh, you can use milder antidotes. Milder than the muscle clenching and the deep breathing is uh, to open the eyes and meditate with your eyes open. Uh, another one, uh, instead of opening the eyes, is just to uh, expand your awareness and become aware of body sensations and sounds and things like that. So, and, and then that will wake you up and then you can come back to the object. So when the dullness is just very, very subtle, then you can catch it at that stage. And what you'll do is you'll get to the point that as soon as you realize the dullness is there, that the main thing you do is just make your mind clearer so that you're perceiving the meditation object with more vividness and clarity. Okay, thanks. Okay. So. Another thing that is useful, whenever, whenever somebody's at the stage where uh, you're dealing with dullness, Take advantage of times like when you're falling asleep to familiarize yourself with what happens in the mind when dullness begins to turn into sleepiness. So watch your mind as you fall asleep at night. Watch the things that happen. Watch the way thoughts become disconnected and and images take on strange qualities. And Watch the way the clarity goes away. And then when you go back to meditate, you'll recognize that much more quickly and easily the dullness is coming on because you become, you're becoming familiar with it. Can I say one, one more thing? Yeah. Um, I, th- I notice it also when I'm awake. You know, I, I think I, mean, I must just tend toward dullness or something because I, I, I feel a slight tiredness or sleepiness most of the time or often, mm-hmm. m- way more than an alert yeah. feeling. So I don't know what's... I don't know how to... I guess if in... I keep trying to check to notice what's causing mm-hmm. you know, me to be dull. I'm getting enough sleep. Right. Um, I don't know. I guess food. I have to keep checking for different things. Mm-hmm. Um, well, in terms of the sort of basic energy level, we're all a little bit different. And, you know, some people can't sit quietly and enjoy the sunset for more than 30 seconds without getting antsy. And and other people, uh, they're they're just drawn to relax no matter what. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, however you are is, you know, it's a result of a lot of different factors. But in general, just try to be in a state of joyful appreciation of anything and everything. You know, come into the present moment no matter what you're doing, you know, and just try to see what what is there, uh, what is there that you can appreciate. You know, you're, whether you're driving a car or riding a bus or, you know, uh, whatever it is. Uh, just what is there to appreciate and, and what is there to be joyful and happy about. And that will energize your mind in a very positive way. Um, because the other way that your mind tends to get energized, of course, is, is you start worrying about things. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's, that's not a very good way to go. And then you go sit down and meditate and you keep having the same thoughts come up. So instead, 
tap into that joy that comes to that comes from being in the present moment, being in a place of appreciation, joy, and happiness. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any anyone have anything else they like to talk about? Well, we are uh, a community, a sangha, right? And one of the things that uh, the Buddha taught, he was asked by one of his followers, uh, if, uh, if, if for some assurance that he you know, basically, he said, uh, noble companions, that's an important part of the path. And the Buddha answered, no, <laughs> noble companions is the whole of the path. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you might look at that particular teaching and say, the whole of the path, what about meditation? What about all this other stuff? You know, uh, if, if just hanging out with noble companions. But the thing is that, if in your <clears throat> meditation and your studies you begin to realize the artificiality uh, and the illusoriness of the separation that we normally feel between ourselves and others, when you become aware of that, you also realize how very, very strongly we're all affected by each other. And we're affected by the people, we're affected most strongly by the people we associate with most closely. So the the fastest way to become a bodhisattva and then to become a Buddha is to hang around with other people that are uh, on the same path. And the more of them that have been doing it for longer and are farther along, the better it's going to be. Uh, because we all very strongly reinforce who <clears throat> and what we are. This, uh, this, this empty self that we believe we are, as empty as it is, it is entirely the re- result of causes and conditions, and we're constantly serving as causes and conditions for each other. So it's important to be a part of a sangha and to, you know, make that be the predominant influence in your life as much as you can. Goes the other way too, though. Of course, to the degree that you are sincerely pursuing a spiritual path, that is going to affect other people. And and I don't mean in the sense that you're going to, you know, be constantly telling them what they should practice or believe or do. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with you being that way. And since we are all interconnected, no matter what you do or don't say, it's going to have some influence. But it also goes beyond that. You know, we're not in a situation where the only people we can associate with are, are people who are on a similar spiritual path. We associate with a whole lot of other people, right? And One of the most important things that we can do is to cultivate our attitude towards these people and, and how we see them. I think, uh, well, Bill, is, is it not true that they say that the most effective psychotherapists are the ones that believe in their patients? <laughs> if a therapist believes the patient can overcome their problems and okay. develop a better way, then that patient will be much more likely to be successful. So if you can believe in all of the people that you're around, 
even the ones that are most trying and difficult. You know, if you can sincerely see in them uh, the Buddha nature waiting to be awakened. Uh, yeah, and this is where the practice of uh, virtue and uh, generosity and loving kindness and patience and all of these things uh, comes into play, comes into play over and over again in many ways. But uh, always be aware of the profound impact that you have on other people. See the best in them, cultivate the best in them, bring out the best in them. And, uh, of course, for your benefit and theirs both, try not to do the opposite. You know, uh, with right speech, of course, speech is rather meaningless and, and unless there's two people, right? It is a social dynamic. Now, as far as false speech goes, you know, it only takes one of the pair to lie. So you're mainly working on yourself and trying to to keep the uh, keep your precepts and be virtuous and, and to not engage in false speech. And the same thing with harsh speech. You know, it's rare. I suppose it does happen, but in most cases, the person you're speaking harshly to is not inviting it. <laughs> so once again, that's something that you know you are on guard for yourself. But let's take divisive speech and gossip, and look at those. Those are two-way dynamics. Okay? And if you want to keep your precepts, and if you want to bring out the best in someone else, then divisive speech, you know, that's, that's a really good illustration of how things work both ways. Um, not to engage in divisive speech, but also not to encourage divisive speech in others. To listen to divisive speech, um, you know, uh, I mean, sometimes there's a, maybe an element of skillful means in allowing a person to say something that they're overflowing with, but to just let them do that and let them reaffirm that this is a good way to speak and behave is, is not skillful means. And you need to somehow or another bring help help to bring them away from that point. Otherwise your listening is as much a part of it. And the same thing with gossip. You know, so so that's a that's an illustration of these things. It goes way beyond that. We're the part of, a part of a world community and it seems that you have very little impact on most of what's going on in the world. And it can be very discouraging. You look at all the wars that are going on. You look at the things that people are doing, the groups of people who are not only motivated <coughs> by hatred themselves, but put massive amounts of energy into uh, instilling hatred in others. And then out of hatred they do things which turns other people against them and creates more hatred. And, and you see, oh, it, it seems very discouraging. You know. Very discouraging. All the terrible things that are going on, right? I, I'm sure it bothers all of us. And uh, politics and the things that are going on, well, the things that are going on in our own country. You know, it's appalling. The manipulation, the deceit, the greed, and, you know, uh, I'm sure none of us can look at this without sometimes feeling a lot of discouragement, hopelessness, right? And, of course, we might, when we experience that, go for refuge to our own practice and our own liberation. But there really is no single thought that you have that doesn't have implications far beyond what you can immediately recognize. So it is important to try to practice 
you know, in the same way you would if you're dealing with a very difficult individual on a one-on-one basis, where you would try to practice patience <coughs> and understanding and forgiveness and loving kindness. You try to have compassion for the, the suffering that is making the person be so difficult, uh, for the ignorance that keeps them from seeing the effects that they're having on themselves and someone else. Um, Forgive them because you realize that they are only trying to escape their own pain, but they don't know the way to do that. Responding to them with loving kindness. And there's hope, you know, if you're dealing with another individual and you uh, have the courage to continue to deal with them, it means that you must have some hope that there is a better side to them that can eventually be brought forth or can triumph or shine through, right? Well, this applies to the way that we think about everything else. If you if you take a very negative point of view about the world as a whole and the future of mankind and what's happening to the planet, and I mean, there's no end of things, right? <laughs> no end of things. And they're inescapable. You can't... You can't brush them off and disregard them for very long before, in one form or another, one of them thrusts itself into your awareness. So, I I suggest that you become very, very skillful in, whenever that happens, uh, calling forth patience and understanding and compassion and trying to bring forth the hope, you know, call up the idea that all human beings, without exception, have the capacity, have the inherent Buddha nature which can potentially be uh, awakened and realized. And don't make assumptions that your way of seeing things is necessarily accurate when you look, okay, This is the way things are going, and there's no way it can end up except it's got to hit the bottom. Because that may seem so real, and if you hold that, then that's going to affect how you see everything else. Uh, And it's going to have all kinds of other effects that you can't even imagine in the future. On the other hand, if you can keep in mind that, well, it looks like it's going like that, but it is all empty, and so it's so foolish of me to think that my mental projection is how the future is going to be and how it's going to end up. And instead try to come to a place of equanimity and acceptance that, okay, this is what's happening. I'm a part of this. And it's bigger than my little mind is to figure out. But the one thing that I can contribute is, is hope, positive thinking, patience, understanding, compassion, loving kindness. And practice these in every aspect of your life. And then as you go along and you have experienced less and less of a distinction between you and the other people you deal with, then one really wonderful thing that happens is that you can start treating yourself with the same degree of uh, understanding and compassion and patience and forgiveness and so on and so forth. So this is something that I had on my mind, so since nobody asked any questions. Mm-hmm. Well, that was my question. That was your question. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thanks. Good well, question. Well, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Already. Thanks for reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I sensed that. You know. As a matter of fact, I sense that you weren't the only one that was experiencing that. Uh, I am too. Could, <laughs> could you speak to same, equanimity? I was wondering about some of the same things. C- could you speak to equanimity? I, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, yes. Equanimity is... It is a non, 
reactiveness. It's an acceptance of what is, which it's not absolutely in any sense at all. Let's talk about what it isn't. In the sense that it's acceptance of what is, it is not at all any kind of hesitance to try to make positive change. But it's making positive change from a foundation of what is, is. And not uh, struggling against or resisting or basically not uh, wasting the energy that could be used in some positive way uh, by resisting what is. So it, it is acceptance of what is. It's non-reactivity. What it absolutely is not is indifference. And it's not neutrality. Um, you know, in terms of the three basic types of uh, uh, feelings that we have, or affective responses, or, or hedonic states that arise in response to things, we find them to be pleasant, we find them to be unpleasant, or we find them to be neither. Um, equanimity is often present when there is, uh, when, when what you are is, is experiencing is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And so we all know what it's like to be in a state of mental non-reactivity because we have those circumstances arise where the mind doesn't react because it can just take or leave whatever's happening, it doesn't matter. Without judgment. Without judgment. And, and so it's not anything strange or unfamiliar. Now we don't always have equanimity when there's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Sometimes we're craving pleasure and so we, uh, we reject the the neither pleasant nor unpleasant, or we're craving stimulation, or we're craving some sort of affirmation of our being and selfhood. So, you know, but nevertheless, the point is that anybody looks at their own experience and say, ah, oh, okay, equanimity, that's the way my mind is when, when what I'm confronted with is not particularly pleasant or unpleasant, I can take it or leave it. Now, equanimity that we want to cultivate is a kind of non-reactivity that uh, reacts in the same way when the experience itself is inherently pleasant or unpleasant. So when you have pain, for example, that instead of resisting it, you accept it. And when there's pleasure, instead of grasping to it or pursuing it, you just accept it. So you would accept a pleasant experience or a painful experience uh, equally, that you just accept that they are there. Um, which doesn't mean that you know if somebody's standing on your toe that you don't ask them to get off, right? <laughs> but, and that's what I mean about, there's nothing about being in a state of acceptance and mental non-reactivity that keeps you from rationally responding and recognizing that there is a, an, an improved, more wholesome possibility that can be uh, brought about through appropriate action. But if you have equanimity, the other thing that is important is that you take the action to bring about a more wholesome state, but without any attachment. So if it doesn't turn out, you're not, you don't react. You're not upset. So equanimity means, it definitely means not judging. It doesn't mean lack of discernment. Because you, and, but discernment should be rooted in the wholesomeness or unwholesomeness. Uh, and by the wholesomeness or unwholesomeness, really, you know, we could, we could talk about, well, how do you decide whether something's wholesome or unwholesome? Uh, and the easiest way to do that is to understand the kind of impact that it's having uh, on others and, and 
on your future self. If it's going to bring about results that are associated with uh, with suffering or conducive to more suffering in the future, then it's basically unwholesome. Um, and if it's something that is going to bring about uh, greater understanding, move a person towards liberation, uh, wisdom, uh, compassion, uh, any kind of good qualities like that, then, it, then it's wholesome. But discernment is recognizing the wholesome and unwholesome qualities of things. But that's not the same as judging. And uh, so if you can let go of judgment, if you have discernment, you can accept what is, you can see the path to something better. You can initiate action. And then by staying in the present, you're in the present where you accept the situation, you're in the present where you're bringing action into being, and then you're in the present where you're observing the result. And if in all of those present moments you are accepting, the present, without judgment, then that's equanimity. Thank you. But the important thing is to, uh, about equanimity that I mentioned because I think a, a, there is a tendency to misunderstand. Is it's not indifference. It's not not caring. And it's not not feeling. It's not making everything be neither pleasant nor unpleasant because you can't. You know, uh, there's going to be pleasantness and, and unpleasantness, but it's about it's about accepting. Uh, and it's not about inaction. It's about action with wisdom, based on discernment, without attachment. Without attachment. You can see how this plays out in your life. Um, unpleasant things, or un, that's, that's not, yeah, unpleasant things happen. Uh, you observe them with discernment, and uh, you make changes, and as a result, um, they go away in the quality of your life and, and of the of the larger being that you are, if you take into account the community that you're a part of, the Sangha, or the world of sentient beings in general, then that's a good thing. And, and so you you accept it. But if it doesn't turn out, well, you accept that too. You don't put yourself in the place of, of judging. You know, it's going back to what we were talking about before, where you look at things and you think that you can see where this whole mess is going and it's, you know, you don't make that judgment. It's just, you just, every moment you start to refresh. Okay, this is the way it is now. And where can we go next? You rely on your own joy and happiness as coming from inside you and being quite independent of the success and failure of your efforts or whatever happens to be taking place in the world of your perceptions. And we're all going to get sick and die. If you, if you have some period of practice in your life of seeing things, uh, from this kind of perspective, then you can approach the changes in your life, the inevitable changes in your life, with exactly the same equanimity. Okay, dying is what we're doing now. Great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just do the best job of it we can. Yeah. Without attachment. Anything else? Yes. yes. Um, do you have any more uh, to say about the soul creation that you started last week? Mm -hmm. Well, that is what I have been talking about right now. I did identify it as that, but you know, the, 
remember that the first thing that we need to do is to try to overcome the tendency to separate ourselves from uh, from anything and regarding ourselves as a part of a community and being joined with others uh, is is a very important part of that and um, Training, training ourselves to come from a place of, uh, of loving kindness and compassion and, and so forth. That is all very much a part of it. Um, um, what I, there, there were some things that I actually had thought about talking about today in that regard, but we'll save them for another time, which is, it's related to this. Um, you know, for... It, for creating a sort of unified and robust, resilient uh, personhood, you know, uh, to create a, 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 a soul-like self, you need to, what is always going to be destructive to the process is that tendency to uh, reinforce the sense of separateness and separation. And so any practices that help to dissolve those boundaries are very, very important. So, for example, the practices of the uh, what's called the four divine uh, abodes or the Brahma Viharas, that's uh, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And then there's a lot of other practices, too, that do a similar thing, like the practice of uh, uh, learning to replace yourself with another, which is basically trying to, to remove that boundary. You know, you've, you've drawn the circle, this is me, and that's you, and you try to enlarge that boundary so that, that uh, you're a part of what's inside that, and so I'm as interested in what your needs and what your desires are as I am and what my needs and my desires are. And so I let that that um, part of myself that normally functions to meet the needs of my egoic self to meet the needs of others around me. So those are things we can talk about uh, at another time. But that's that's the direction that, that cool. this this whole thing goes. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I did men- mention when I first brought this up, but I'll mention it again. There, there is a danger in these kinds of practices that you can... Uh, you can come to a place of a kind of... Uh, you know, if you don't work on understanding that there is no self and the separation is an illusion. Uh, and of course, if you look at the Buddha's teaching, that was the most important core of everything he taught. The, the entry into, uh, uh, into the uh, paths of enlightenment first comes with recognizing the emptiness of the personal self. And it culminates in Buddhahood with the final dissolution of the sense of separateness. So this is right at the core. So if we're going to practice this, then we have to recognize that of fundamental importance to the success of anything is overcoming our sense of separate boundedness. Uh, And of course, that's the ultimate goal. In the beginning and in the intermediate stages, it's all about ceasing to react on the basis of that feeling while that feeling is still there. While I still regard myself as a separate uh, uh, as a separate self, I can learn not to behave from that basis anymore. I don't need to. I don't need to be constantly acting out of desire and aversion at the expense and to the detriment of those around me. And so, all of these practices are to help us to get out of all of the habit patterns, because as we get out of the habit patterns and behaving that way. It's going to make it a lot easier to to step outside of the illusion that those habits are based on, and because they're based on it, they keep reinforcing it and supporting it. 
Because the danger is that you can you can bring about a unification of mind, as we talked about. Uh, but if it's still based in an ego, then what you end up with is a very powerful, charismatic uh, person imbued with enormous uh, self-confidence and certainty, but who's totally narcissistic. That's the one you're thinking exactly that. <laughs> and, of course, they may have developed that on a spiritual path with all kinds of noble uh, things that they that they say, but sooner or later that you know that self that they are still so clinging to is going to lead them to do things that are for their benefit and not for the benefit of those around them. And you know, we've seen how often that have hap- has happened in spiritual groups, cults. And, teachers and things like that. So so that is the danger. You know, we, we can do a really good job on part of it, but miss out on the most important part of all. So, so let's start in the very beginning. Before we create a powerful self, let's make sure that self is rooted in uh, uh, an expansive sense of unification with everything. So that the, the, the powerful self that we develop is an aspect of, of a whole. It seems the most powerful self would be the one that didn't see. What's that? It, it, it seems that the most powerful would be the one that doesn't see himself, that doesn't uh, Absolutely. aspire to be powerful, charismatic, any Absolutely. of that. That's right. That's right. You know, and, and that was the power of the Buddha. And that's the power of people like the Dalai Lama in the world today. He doesn't aspire to his own power. He's not coming from a place of, of selfhood. And that's that's where his true power comes from, mm-hmm. and that is exactly that's where we want to go. Yeah. You know, if we can be, from the, you know, from the conventional point of view, the Dalai Lama and the Buddha were both selves. They were bodies and minds. They were, you know, all the same five aggregates negotiating their way through the world over many many decades, but they were not coming from that place of separate selfhood. And that's where we want to go. They were both very happy. And they both did a lot for the benefit, and in the case of the Dalai Lama, still doing a lot for the benefit of all things. So, so you're right. That's the most powerful self of all. It's the one that doesn't, that is not invested in its own selfhood. Yes. That takes a lot of honesty. It does. It takes a tremendous amount of honesty. And that, that brings to mind that maybe the mind is not a very honest <laughs> place to dwell in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, see, that is the... When, when you realize that all of your perceptions are generated by your mind, and you know it's not that your mind is is inherently good or bad; it just does what it does. But you know your your mind doesn't. That's what, that you have to train your mind to be honest, because your mind doesn't start out in life seeing any special virtue in in. Uh, Honesty over dishonesty. You know, it's all about getting the result, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so that's why we practice uh, not engaging in false speech. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be a rather, uh, this is really an aside, but it seems to be something that is 
relatively unique to human beings. That, um, the psychological studies are, are, are the ability to intentionally deceive find that animals don't have much ability to do that. They, uh, they have the ability to, uh, to hide, and they sometimes have instinctive behaviors, you know, like a mother bird which will act like it has a broken wing. But uh, does the mother bird actually think that she's, you know, to have the same kind of thought processes that we do when we say, I didn't do it, he did it, you know? <laughs> Probably not. And, and feigning a broken wing is a totally selfless act because she's really putting herself in That's harm's right, yeah. way to protect That's right. her young. Yeah. 